So let's take a look at our rigid rotor wave functions in even a little more detail. What we've seen so far is we've got a collection of wave functions, and I've written more of them here than, than I've written before. Previously, we've just seen these first four. Now I've written a few more until I ran out of room at the bottom of the board here. And I've included the normalization constant. So every one of these different wave functions has its own individual normalization constant. If you normalize the wave function, you can find these normalization constants uh, given the wave function. So there's many of these wave functions. This list continues on forever. There's an infinite number of solutions that solve the rigid rotor Schrodinger equation. And if we look at enough of these, we can see that there's several patterns that we can count on when uh, describing the rigid rotor wave functions. So when we're talking about these wave functions, they have some features in common with each other. First of all, they all have this normalization constant. constant that's different for every wave function. Some of them happen to be the same as each other, but in general, uh, the, way the normalization constants are different for uh, every wave function. In addition to the constant out front, there's a term that involves some sines or cosines of theta. And if we look closely, that's, we can describe that as a polynomial in sines and cosines of theta. It's either a linear polynomial, there's one term, sine theta or cosine theta or sine theta, or it might be a quadratic term with a sine squared or sine and cosine, so degree two polynomial in sines and cosines. So there's a, the theta dependence of this function involves either one power or two powers or more powers of these uh, sines and cosines. So that's how the theta dependence looks. The phi dependence always shows up in the exponential. I've either got e to the phi, e to the i phi with a plus sign or a negative sign, e to the 2 i phi with a plus sign or a minus sign. So there's e to the i times phi times some small integer. That integer might be 1, integer might be negative 1, it might be negative 2, it might be positive 2, it might even be 0. e to the 0 phi gives us the, the phi dependence of this term and this term and this term. But in general, it seems like I always have an e to the i times some integer times phi. So those are the characteristics of these wave functions. And if we look a little closer, particularly let's look at this uh, polynomial dependence on, on theta in sines and cosines. If I divide the list up in this way, then we can see that these are the terms that I've called linear. I've either got a sine or I've got a cosine or I've got a sign, but there's one trigonometric, trigonometric function of theta. So I'm going to call those the, the L equals 1. Uh, so in this, uh, this set of three is the L equals 1 functions. The one simple constant wave function, the wave function just equal to this normalization constant, there is no dependence on theta. So that's like a, a sine raised to the zeroth power, or, sine, or cosine raised to the zeroth power. So there's, there's a zeroth order polynomial. The, the uh, theta dependence here is, is a zeroth order polynomial or just constant. And now if I look below this uh, line here, I've got the functions I've called quadratic, either a sine squared or maybe a cosine squared or a sine times a cosine. But in general, there's two powers of these sine and cosine functions. So these I'll call the L equals 2 functions. So I'm using this variable L to describe the degree of the polynomial that, that describes the theta dependence of the function. So that number L that I've just described, it's, it's an in integer. We call that number a, a quantum number. It's an integer or a number that describes the quantum mechanical wave functions or the quantum properties of each of these wave functions. In particular, we call that the angular momentum quantum number. And it's not obvious right now why we would call it an angular momentum quantum number. Quantum number just means number describing a quantum mechanical system. The reasons we call it an angular momentum quantum number will become clear soon enough when we move a little further and talk about more quantum mechanical properties. The, the preview of that is that the larger the value of L, the more oscillation this function has. So as it oscillates up and down more often, the angular dependence of this function uh, has, has a higher angular momentum. 
Uh, so, but right now that's just a name. We call L the angular momentum quantum number, and it's one of the numbers that helps us describe or distinguish these different wave functions from each other. The other way we can distinguish them from each other is via the, uh, the phi dependence. So I can also choose a quantum number that describes the phi dependence, and that one I've already given a name to. That's the, the integer m that describes the phi dependence in this exponential. So I either have e to the i times negative 1 times phi, or 0, or positive 1. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, positive 2. So m is another quantum number. That also has a name. That's the magnetic quantum number. Again, not obvious from these equations necessarily yet why it would be a magnetic quantum number. The preview of that answer is each of these functions with a different value of m will behave differently from the others when you put it in a magnetic field. So when you put these diatomic molecules with these wave functions in a magnetic field, it's their magnetic quantum number that describes uh, in part how they behave. So m is the value uh, of the integer coefficient up in this exponent for the phi dependence of the function. And notice also Let's go ahead and label these functions by their m values. So sometimes it jumps right out of this. This function has m equals minus 1. This one has m equals plus 1. The functions with no phi dependence, they have a quantum number of 0 because e to the 0 uh, is just 1. So we've not written the, the phi dependence there. So likewise, this term with has no phi dependence. That's an m equals 0 wave function. For these L equals 2 functions, I've got minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. So M is equal to minus 2, or minus 1, or 0, or positive 1, or positive 2. And you might see a pattern now for the functions with L equals 1. M could be 1, or could be negative 1, or it could be 0, the value in between. But it, we don't have any values of m is plus 2 or minus 2. When l is equal to 2, I have m equals minus 2 and m equals plus 2 and all the integers in between, but m doesn't get any larger than 2 or any smaller than negative 2. When l is 0, we could think of this as saying m is equal to 0 or it's equal to negative 0 or any integers in between. There's only one of those integers. So it happens to be the case that the, the valid values for m it could be negative L, or one larger than that, or and so on, all the way up to L minus 1, or L. So negative 2 up to 2, negative 1 up to 1, negative 0 up to 0. If I were to continue this list with some L equals 3 wave functions, which exist, then the values of M would range from negative 3 up to 3, and all the integer values in between. So those are the possible values of the magnetic quantum number. The Angular momentum quantum number, as we've seen here, if we want to list the possible values of the, uh, the angular momentum quantum number, they could be 0 or 1 or 2, and that pattern continues. It's any integer value of L beyond that. So we have these quantum numbers that help us describe these wave functions. And now notice that every single wave function that I've written down has a unique pair of, of quantum numbers. If I pick one of these wave functions out of the list, I can describe that either with the full quantum mechanical function, or I can describe it as the L equals 2, M equals minus 1 wave function. So what that means is when I write down this long list of, of wave functions, I can describe those with indices. If I give you the angular momentum quantum number and if I give you the magnetic quantum number, I've uniquely identified one particular wave function. And now we see that the general pattern for these functions I've got some normalization constant, which depends on the value of L and M. The normalization constant is different in general for every different L and M. I've got some polynomial function that depends on L and depends on M, the polynomial dependence on theta. And I've got the phi dependence is just e to the i m phi. So, this part is pretty easy to predict. If I say, tell me what this looks like for an m equals 5 magnetic quantum number equal to 5 wave function, you could just say e to the 5i phi. 
but if I say, tell me what this function, the polynomial function, would look like when L is equal to 7 and M, equals, uh, M is equal to 4, you'd have a hard time doing that right now. So we do have some more to understand about the, the uh, behavior of this polynomial function that describes the theta dependence of these wave functions. And there is a way to understand that more systematically, and that's what we'll explore next.